Greetings from the mysterious dimension of Paranormal M. Embark on a journey with us as we uncover the secrets of the afterlife and dive into the realms of the supernatural. Hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications to never miss out on our spine-tingling and haunting stories. Girl in the Window I'm 23 now, but I was 17 when this story took place. My grandfather was very clearly nearing the end of his days, so we wanted to be with him before he passed away. So my family visited him in Tennessee for Thanksgiving. On the day we were leaving, I woke up feeling sick. My family lives fairly close to Los Angeles, so it took a long plane ride, and by the time we landed, I was feeling pretty awful. Being in an environment 30 degrees colder than what I'm used to didn't help either. On our first night there, we stayed at the house of my mom's old college friend. It was an old house that she had just bought and she moved into recently. She was telling my mom about how old it was and why she ended up buying it and whatnot. This was during the car ride, but I was feeling so groggy that I wasn't really absorbing any of it. When we finally got there, I could see what she meant by old. It looked like a Victorian era house and had extremely narrow hallways that those old houses tend to have. When we went inside, I felt a really oppressive energy immediately surround me. I have anxiety, and being in a new, unfamiliar place will often trigger it. So I assumed that all it was, but didn't really pay much attention to it. Instead, I decided to just go to bed despite it only being around eight. I just felt terrible and wanted the day to be over. I slept on the couch in the living room. Initially, I had a lot of trouble getting to sleep. My head was killing me, and I felt like my entire body was being weighed down, which I attributed to being sick and exhausted. I managed to fade in and out of sleep throughout the night. Later, though, sometime around maybe 5 a.m., I woke up to see someone else there. At the foot of the couch, there was a large semicircle-shaped window that perfectly framed a street lamp outside. Standing under the street lamp was a girl with long brown hair, and she looked terribly ill. She had dark circles under her eyes and looked pale as a sheet. She was barefoot and was wearing an old-looking white nightgown. Not old as in old and worn, but old as in antique, if that makes sense. She was just standing out there, staring at me through the window and mouthing something over and over again. It was windy and leaves were blowing around, but her hair and gown didn't move at all in the breeze. In addition to that, must have been horrendously cold outside, but she didn't seem to be reacting at all. She just kept mouthing the words to me. Of course, I couldn't hear her, and in my sleepy sick stupor I said, What? I can't understand you. A voice then responded to me, although it's hard for me to describe where it came from. It felt like it was coming from the left side of my head kind of behind me at the same time. Although it didn't feel like it was coming from anyone in the room with me, but rather like it was coming from inside my brain. The voice said, She's saying gossamer. It's good for fevers. She's trying to help you. I got really scared at this, and I asked, well, Why? She doesn't know me. Why is she out there? Why does she want to help me? Then suddenly, as if in a blink of an eye, 
He could feel the dark figure of the girl who was outside just a second ago standing next to the couch, leering over me. The light in the room was coming from behind her, so she looked like a dark shadow person. Leaning over me, she whispered, It's okay. You're going to be all right. I immediately woke up at that, and I felt absolutely terrible. I was extremely disoriented as well, because I remembered waking up and seeing the girl outside the window. Couldn't figure out why I had just woken up again. I tried to get up and tell my mom that I needed help. But as soon as I got up, I had a hard time walking. Once I got to the door of the bedroom my parents were in, I collapsed to the floor and pawed at the door calling for my mom. When she came out and found me on the floor, she took me into the bathroom and sat me down. Everything was starting to get very hazy. When my mom was trying to get ibuprofen or something, I apparently passed out. The girl was with me again. Only this time, she was behind me, pulling me down into the deep, deep ocean. My first instinct told me that she was trying to drag me down to hell. My mom later told me that I was having a seizure at this point. When I came to from it, I remember telling my mom that I felt really, really bad. She tried to help me get up and back to the couch, but on the way over I blacked out again and had another seizure on the floor. I vaguely remember hearing my mom yelling to my dad for help, but it's hard to piece it together. I had never had a seizure before in my life, so it's not like this was a common thing for me either. The entire time I felt like the girl from earlier was trying really hard to take me with her, like she wanted me to succumb to illness. When I finally got back to the couch with the help of my dad, my fever immediately broke. I started sweating like crazy and suddenly I felt loose and relaxed, as if I was at at ease after the whole ordeal. I no longer felt like the girl was there with me, and honestly, I was so exhausted that I wasn't even thinking about it. My mom stayed with me until I fell back asleep, and I was fine the next morning. I was still a bit sick the rest of the time, but nothing compared to that first night. Logic tells me that it was probably a fever dream, but the fact that I immediately felt something wrong when I stepped foot in that house, and that I had two seizures after the encounter with that girl, leads me to believe that it was something else. I'm not sure that it was a ghost, because to be honest, it felt more like she was an angel that could tell I was sick and was trying to tell me to, well, rather take me to hell with her. I don't think she was trying to help me like the voice in my head claimed she was. I think she was trying to kill me. I've never felt closer to death in my life. I've never told my parents about this experience for fear of ridicule, and I figure that I'll never be back to that house anyway. Especially since my mom's friend has since relocated once again, so there isn't much of a point. I just hope that I never encounter whatever that girl was again. Nursing Home Stories I'll start off by saying I'm a CNA and I used to work at a shitty nursing home. I always worked at like 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. But this one night in the winter, there was a storm. It wasn't too bad, but no one was showing up for the next shift, the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. So before the end of my shift, people were being mandated to stay, and I was one of them. It came to the end of the shift, I did my normal rounds and was about to start some cleaning duties. When my supervisor came up to me, had told me that I was switching places with another CNA, which I kinda was okay, but whatever. There I was sent, well, to where another CNA, like I said, a shitty place, 
so I had to do my rounds again to make sure my haul was all good. When I grabbed my clipboard, I had noticed a woman at the end of the hall. So I decided I'll start at the end of the hall so I can check on this woman first. I had asked her if there was any other thing wrong and introduced myself. Her reply was only, couldn't sleep. So I asked her if I could do anything. She never responded, so I just started my rounds. As I came out of the first room, I realized there wasn't any more, so I decided to speed up on checking people to try to find this woman. About halfway down the hall, I was heading out of the room. To my surprise, she was standing there in the doorway. I jumped back and slightly yelled from getting scared. Luckily, I didn't disturb anyone. I began asking her where she was and where she wanted to go. Thinking maybe after her little walk, she'd be tired. She only answered with short answers. Yes, no, sure. I asked her where her room was. 134, which wasn't on my side and she was quite a bit from the room. So I took her there. The room was weirdly cold and empty. I asked if she was cold and tucked her in and that was that. Later on, me and another CNA were called in for the beginning of the shift's meeting. This is when the phone rang. It was room 134 asking for me. With that being said, I told the nurse about the lady being off and her little trip around the unit and asked her why her room was alone and why it was so cold and empty. He answered with, There's no one in room 134. That woman passed away maybe one or two nights ago. I laughed saying, No way. I tucked her in and had conversations with her. Stop joking around. He showed me her documentation of her passing and then her empty room couldn't even fathom that that had actually happened. Still a huge shock to me. Nursing Home Stories, Part 2 So again, this nursing home wasn't very good. It wasn't legal with a lot of things. But the time I became a CNA, I was 18, but I've been working there for a year already. So I was pretty young, and a lot of people who would just tell me, you know, this probably isn't good for you, which little was like, what can I do about it? But anyway, I worked with a woman who didn't like me, which was, I guess, because I was so new, I was used to everything by the books, and I'd say things like, we can't do that, or... We have to do it step by step. And because she was so close with our charge nurse, he wasn't fond of me. This one day I had said something and the nurse didn't want to deal with it. They had sent me over to a unit that was short-staffed. I helped out over there and after our shift change meeting, the nurse on the unit was like, Oh my God, you're here today. And I explained why. She then replied with, I'd love to keep you here, but your unit is actually the short one. I'd get in trouble for keeping you. So I went back, answered call lights, and then it was dinner. My charge nurse sent me in a room to feed a bed-bound resident. But during the meeting I wasn't there for, so his diet was changed and wasn't updated on our dietary sheets. Now to keep in mind, this resident has been in the hospital and isn't from my part of the unit. And because I was so new, I didn't really know wrong from right. So I fed him a few bites and was paged into another room for help. I came back and the guy was choking. Within the week, he died because of aspiration. I was so upset and blamed it on myself. Every time I went into that room, it was always kind of feeling like I was being watched. Big mirror in the room that you could see in the hallway from. I always would see someone walk in, but no one was ever there, and it happened a lot. Then I had this reoccurring dream of this little boy who I've never seen before. I would ask, how's my brother, and would always tell me that I forgive you. 
Then one day I found a picture of this boy, the one in my dreams. And, well, it was the man who I blamed myself for his passing. I then looked for his brother, who was on a different one, and made it a thing of just normally checking up on him. A month later, the man came to me in my dreams and told me he's happy now and thanked me for caring for his brother. That was the end of hearing from that man. After he said that, though, it was like a huge weight was lifted off of me. A ghost said my name in an old barn. I, a 24-year-old female, was about 15 at the time of this, and my friend also, 25-year-old female, but 16 at the time, we used to go to this horse barn after school. She would go every day to muck the stalls to work off the board for her horse to stay there. It wasn't a huge barn, sorry for all the details, but it pertains to the story. It had probably 16 stalls, but maybe 12 horses actually boarded there. The building was like a straight line with the front entrance pointing toward the road and the other end pointed toward the paddocks. It was easy to know if somebody pulled in because the entrance was literally right next to the road and car headlights would shine through the whole barn. Anyways, me and my friend, I'll call her Mandy, we were sitting in the tack room with the door open waiting for my dad to pick us up. This was in the winter of New Hampshire, and it gets dark by like 3.34 during that time, so it was pretty dark out, besides some lights in the barn. We're just sitting there talking, when suddenly I hear someone yell my name, Hannah. Like a question. I didn't say anything about it for about 10 seconds, then Mandy says, Did somebody just call your name? I knew I wasn't crazy then. I said yes, and we both peeked out of the tack door. The voices sounded exactly like my dad. There were no headlights in the drive, and we were the only ones there. I called my dad, and he was still 20 minutes out. I want to add earlier in the day that we were bringing a horse in from the paddocks, and this horse is maybe 25 years old and bomb-proof as hell. He refused to go inside to the point that he actually knocked Mandy over and ran back out took 10 minutes to get him back in. We both have wondered for years what this meant. It's my only and only one, really, encounter with the paranormal. And honestly, now that it's been almost 10 years. The Music Box When I was younger, I was super into all things paranormal. I used to love watching horror films. I tried Ouija boards, going to haunted houses, and of course, telling ghost stories. It wasn't until I was 13 that strange things actually started happening to me personally. And that fascination shifted into a slight fear of the unexplained. Back in the day, my parents used to work in the city. So most mornings, it would just be my sister and I left to go get ready for school alone. One morning, my sister, two years older than me, we were both downstairs on the main floor when we heard it. The faint yet familiar sound of my sister's music box playing in her bedroom. Instantly fearful, my sister and I somehow still managed to build up the nerve to investigate. Back to back, we began walking up the stairs. As soon as we made it to her doorway, the music came to a halt. The tiny bear atop her music box was now motionless, facing us with a seemingly innocent smile. My sister and I hadn't heard that small tune in years. Unsettled, we stood there in the doorway for a moment, or just until the phone rang, startled us out of our confusion. My sister answered, and we were both relieved to hear the sound of my mom's voice on the other line. She began to explain what had just happened to my mom. She slowly raised her hand to point at the wall in front of her. 
Did you just see that? Something or someone just went through the wall, she said, her voice shaking. She genuinely looked terrified. Now, just to clarify, I've always been fascinated by the supernatural, but I doubted that my sister was able to actually see a ghost. As fascinated as I was by the idea, I didn't think it would happen just like that. 8 a.m. in the daylight. I didn't think it did happen. So, as I was convinced my sister was just playing a prank on me, I begged her to stop so we could just leave for school. Insisting that she did see something, and unwavering from that fact, she had convinced me to follow her into the adjacent room to hers, to see if there was actually something there or not. In the next room was a spare bedroom with a closet on the side opposite my sister's room. I huffed and walked toward the closet, yanking the door open as I started to lose my patience for the whole thing. As I opened the doors, however, they began to slowly inch closed immediately after my release of the handles. Confused, I closed the closet and surely enough, it would slowly reopen. Whatever I did, the closet would react in reverse. I'd open it, it'd close, and vice versa. My skin crawled and my sister and I ran out of the house. Not alone. This particular instance was several years ago, back when I used to have a math tutor in high school. Once a week, every Friday after school, I'd have a tutoring session at the library by my house. It started at 3.30 and class would let out around 3, so I was often early. Before my session one afternoon, I went to the washroom. I noticed a woman go into the last stall. When I exited my stall to wash my hands, I noticed the last stall was vacant. But I also hadn't heard the woman leave. Thinking I was losing my mind, I shook it off and went to meet my tutor. After my session, it was about an hour later and I was walking home. This is when I started to sense that I wasn't alone. It felt as though someone was walking about five paces behind me. But I never felt the need to check. Subconsciously, I think I knew it wasn't really someone there. I made it home, and because I'm a weirdo, I stood behind my brother in the garage as he was working at our workbench, trying to freak him out. After not getting the reaction I wanted, my brother, several years older, would take a bit to actually scare him. I entered my house. Upon entering, I started noticing a woman standing in the back corner of each room I entered or passed by. She would just be standing there, motionless and expressionless. For whatever reason, I wasn't actually afraid at the time, but rather curious. I went back downstairs to explain this all to my brother, so he could tell me I was just seeing things. I began explaining this person I kept seeing, and as I began describing her to my brother, he started to nod and started asking questions about what she looked like. I instantly got goosebumps over my whole body and a chill went down my spine as he in great detail described the exact same woman I had seen all afternoon. I stood there speechless as my brother's face fell. He asked, Why do you think I didn't turn around in the garage earlier? Thought it was her. Not that I've ever mentioned it to my brother since, but I'm almost certain neither of us have even saw her ever again. The Scariest Sleep Paralysis I've always experienced sleep paralysis since age 12. I'm 22 now. It would happen maybe twice or three times a month from age 12 to 16. I would feel the typical, what I thought to be, witch on my chest trying to get inside my body. The typical someone climbing into bed with me and wrapping their arms around me and squeezing me until I could hardly breathe. Someone pulling at my legs. 
I've never experienced anything where I've ever seen somebody before until two nights ago. It was typical. I woke up. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I looked around my room and saw nothing. I heard horrifying whispers, however, telling me how every single one of my family members was going to die and how the world was going to end. I would not be spared because I have a wretched soul. My bed was against the wall on the right side of the room and behind it was part of the window leading to the side of my house. The whispers were coming from outside. Once the sleep paralysis was over, I quickly got on my knees and looked outside my window. I saw a woman squatting down near my window with piercing black eyes, short black hair, it was all matted, very pale skin but I could see that her veins were black. She had cuts and bruises all over her legs. Her arms were bent inwards. I don't know how else to explain it besides her elbows were outward of her body. She was carving something into the side of the house with her bloodied fingers. When I made eye contact with her, I passed out and hit my head. I want to believe that this was just a dream and my mind was playing tricks on me. But I've been terrified since that day. The one thing that always gets me though is I've been terrified of my window for as long as I could ever remember. And I barely just recently moved my bed close to my window because I was always thinking that I was just being irrational. I checked outside once I woke up. There was nothing besides a dried brown stain on my wall. It could have been dirt, but I'm too scared to think otherwise. I could see it through the mirror. The year was 2011, and it was my 21st birthday. I don't remember much from earlier in the day. All I can remember is my boyfriend at the time and myself went to my parents' house to see them, spend time with them for my birthday. During my visit with my parents, I noticed that my mother seemed really off. The facial expression she carried seemed far away, like her mind was elsewhere, but her body was there. I do need to point out that my mother and I were extremely close. She was literally my rock, the most important person to me in my life. I remember being there for a few hours, and we had cake and ice cream and took a few pictures. I didn't know it then, but eventually I'd come to the realization that that would be the last picture I would ever get to take with her. I remember getting ready to leave and kissing her and hugging her goodbye. The last word she ever spoke to me was, I love you, I'll see you tomorrow. But sadly, before tomorrow came, she passed away in the middle of the night due to a brain aneurysm. I would later discover a year or so later that she was aware that she was terminally ill fought her battle in mostly silence and alone, only choosing to tell her mother, who was also passed in recent years since. Fast forward about three months after she passed. Up until this point, I've had a few bizarre and otherworldly experiences, but this one takes the cake. My partner and my roommates all worked at the same place, so they worked the same hours, and I was the odd ball out. I worked second shift for a local restaurant and wasn't expected to be at work until 4 p.m. on this particular day. I'm asleep in my bed when I'm woken up by my alarm clock. The time's around 2 p.m. I wake up and roll over to hit the snooze button and turn back over to fall back asleep. When I turn over and close my eyes to drift back off to sleep, I'm startled by the feeling of someone's hand nudging me softly on my arm through my blankets. Naturally, I was instantly terrified. I knew I was home alone and what was happening to me right then shouldn't be happening. It wasn't logical. I remember feeling the heat from fear rise in my cheeks. I couldn't move. I thought that if I just laid there and ignored it, it would go away. 
But oh, how wrong I was. It just kept nudging me. So I gathered the strength and willpower to sit up in my bed and see what it was. But when I did, nothing was there. I don't know what possessed me to look, but my eyes shot directly to the mirror in the bathroom. My partner and I stayed in the master bedroom of the house, which means we also have a bathroom attached to our bedroom. The way my room was set up is you could easily see into the bathroom. As my eyes locked onto the bathroom mirror, I could see perfectly a dark shadow figure slowly, what looked like levitating, make its way across my mirror. As if it knew the only way I could see it was by looking through the mirror. When I saw it, as if all time stopped, I couldn't believe what was happening to me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And most of all, I couldn't believe I was deliberately being made contact with something that I didn't understand at all. Whoever, or whatever this was, wanted my attention, and it wanted me to know that it was there. Something curious is happening at 66 and 2nd in Manhattan. Okay, so bear with me on this one. For those of you Redditors unfamiliar with the land of Manhattan, the roads on the island are laid out in a grid. Avenues run north and south, and the streets run east and west. Most are unidirectional meaning that traffic on, say, 66th runs east to west, while 65th runs west to east. And they tend to alternate so that it's easier to navigate the grid. First Avenue runs north, and Second Avenue runs south, and the intersection forms a box with crosswalks as the sides. Okay, so that grid established. When I drive home from work, I come into the island from Brooklyn to the east, and then head north on FDR Drive. I get off at 61st Street and head north up 1st Ave, up 66th. I turn west onto 66th, and then I turn left again to head south on 2nd Avenue. Keep that in mind. Now my car is parking sensors like many cars, but they're split in half. So there's a parking sensor for the front right, a sensor for the front left, and same goes for the rear bumper. Now the sensor responds with orange bars based on proximity. The closer you get to an object, the more orange bars light up until you're within an inch or two. Then the sensor lights up red. Now when pedestrians walk in between cars during traffic, they tend to get very close to the bumper because the cars themselves are already very close. And pedestrians produce a unique signature with the parking sensors. They immediately jump to red, no orange bar lights up, and then the sensor shuts off just as quickly as the person passes by. So with all of that in mind, this is what gets happening at 66 and 2nd. When I get home, traffic tends to be busy, and sometimes the light will completely cycle before I've had the chance to even make my left turn and I end up with my bumper in the crosswalk but not close enough to a car to make the sensor go off. Sometimes, though, the sensor jumps to red and then off, as if a pedestrian's just passed by. Now, you might be inclined to think it's some environmental factor triggering the sensor. It was just my first thought, too. Until I realized that it's only, and I mean only, ever happened at 66 and 2nd. And only when my car is in the crosswalk. Well, today, maybe there's some sort of radar device around that's messing with it, but nope. It only happens in the crosswalk. Not just outside the crosswalk, only in the crosswalk. Like a pedestrian is walking by, but there's no one there. There's probably some sort of reasonable explanation, but it got me thinking. 66 and 2nd is a pretty busy intersection. I'm not sure if... In its history, a pedestrian or two has been hit. Is it totally unreasonable to think that a crosswalk might be haunted? Food for thought.
my one and only experience. This story happened a year and a half ago. I've only ever shared this story with one other person, the other person who is actually in this story. First, a little about me. I have a formal education in the hard sciences, and I'm halfway through a doctorate of medicine degree program. So those are the lenses through which I see the world. This makes me a natural skeptic on most things. I firmly believe in the existence of extraterrestrial life because of the vastness of the universe makes it a mathematical certainty, but I am far less convinced on the subject of UFOs. Although, there are a number of well-documented events that keep me from dismissing them outright. By the way, this story has nothing to do with aliens, though at least I don't think it does. I guess I only mention it for the purposes of demonstrating that I keep an open mind on things, but that I still need to see at least some sort of suggestive evidence. I'm a huge fan of the paranormal as a genre, though. I find the stories and media fun and entertaining. I like being scared. And I enjoy the experience of reflecting on what if. But it's always been just that to me, a genre of entertainment. Then this happened, and I still can't explain it. My fiancé and I grew up and live in a small city in New England. Honestly, it's really only a city by definition. It's bigger than your average New England town, but it's far more suburban than your average city. The house that my family has lived in since I was two is located on the outskirts of this quote-unquote city. I'm now almost 30, and although my fiancé and I live in an apartment below her mom's place, I still keep a lot of my stuff there at my old house, including my motorcycle. When you pull out of the driveway and go one way, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to get into the city proper, but if you go the other way, it takes about two minutes to hit farmland. Heading towards the farms, you end up on a road called Pine Hill Road. On this road is a very old cemetery with gravestones that date as far back as the 1700s. The cemetery encompasses a square plot of land bordered on three sides and by Pine Hill Road on the fourth. The official name of the cemetery is Pine Hill Cemetery, but everybody in that area calls it by its other name, Blood Cemetery. It is allegedly one of the most haunted cemeteries in New England. The name derives from the blood familiar, excuse me, the name derives from the blood family burial plot located more or less in the center of the grounds, and it's where most of the alleged activity arises from. Tangibly, the blood headstone is engraved with the image of a hand, and it is said that during the day this hand points towards the heavens, while at night it points down toward the ground. It's also said that the ghost of Abel blood roams the grounds. It's illegal to enter a cemetery at night here, and the police do patrol this area because of how frequently people try to get in at night to see for themselves. I personally have never actually been inside the grounds, day or night, not even during the experience that I'm about to describe. By the way, I've used the real name of the place. Feel free to Google the cemetery all you want. That way you'll know I'm talking about a real place with real stories attached to it. And this really happened to me. I've driven past this cemetery a million times before, day and night, and not once have I ever seen or experienced anything out of the ordinary. That is, not until one night last fall. It must have been around late August or early September 2017. Summer was on its way out and fall was just starting to let everyone know it was on its way. It was late and pretty dark one night when my fiance and I were out for a ride on my motorcycle. We love riding around this area because there's little traffic. The roads are just windy enough to make it fun. 
and the farms are beautiful. We were riding up Pine Hill Road and we were just beginning to pass blood on the left as we've done so many times before. Going about 30 miles per hour it must only take 3 to 5 seconds to pass the whole property. But this time something very strange happened to me. Time appeared to slow down. When something red reflected, it was across the visor of my helmet. I turned my head to the left and this is what I saw. Up in a tree, just along the left border of the cemetery, there was a floating orb of the brightest red light I'd ever seen. So bright it was that it was center was white. Orb isn't really the right way to describe it. Though because it wasn't just a sphere of red light, it looked like it was oozing and dripping like it was made of plasma. The best way I can think to describe it is that it looked like a tip of a signal flare when it's held off the ground. It was like that bright and it was oozing like the tip of a flare, but it was not shooting out from anywhere like a flare does. Where a flare has a sort of elongated shape from the spark shooting out at the end, this was circular, and unlike a flare, there was no visible physical object from which it was dripping and burning orb was emanating from. It just was. It was bright, and it was oozing, and it was dripping, and it was floating up in a tree. I really can't underscore enough just how bright this thing was to me. Then I noticed the rest. Moving around this red orb was a set of hands. I didn't notice them at first because of how bright the orb was and how dark the world was, but as my eyes began to focus somewhat, I realized that there was something else in the tree with the orb, and it looked like it was actually conjuring the orb. The thing was humanoid looking, but it didn't look human at all. It looked like a scrawny and lanky E.T., you know, E.T. phone home sort of thing with nubby joints, fingers, and features, but with scrawny limbs. Its face was long, narrow at the top and bottom, but wide in the middle. It was bumpy. It was a face unlike any human face I'd ever seen before, and I've seen a lot of deformed faces. Laprotomous faces, hippoplastic faces, coarse faces, faces without calvaria, Hell, I've even seen real cyclopses. Yep, cyclopses really do exist. It's actually quite a sad thing because cyclopia results from a condition that also prevents the brain from dividing. The baby is usually stillborn. This thing's face looked like it was from hell. Its skin looked dark brown and it appeared to be wearing some sort of baggy looking cloak. Its legs were crossed, its hands circling around this extremely bright oozing red orb and it was hovering a few inches over a branch in this tree. Passing the cemetery on my motorcycle that night felt like the longest three to five seconds of my life. As we came to the other end of the cemetery, time appeared to resume itself as normal. I looked back over my shoulder and it was gone. I looked back again, still gone. Twice more I looked back. Twice more it was nowhere to be seen. I immediately pulled over and my fiance asked me what was wrong because she knows I never pull my bike over to the side of the road unless there's something up that I have to do. Especially when it's dark and especially not on these windy roads where people tend to drive like a bat out of hell. Can't blame them. These roads are fun. Did you see that back there? I asked her. See what? That red light we passed at the cemetery just now. Red light? She asked, a little confused. Turns out she hadn't seen a damn thing. Nothing. I explained to her what I had just seen and experienced or whatever it was that had happened. She believed me, noting how I looked visibly disturbed by something, but whatever that something was, she hadn't seen any of it. It was dark and we were moving, so normally I wouldn't have been so surprised by her not seeing something like a figure up in a tree we passed by, an orb of light. It was just so damn bright. There were no other cars around. No houses from which a porch light could have been peering through those particular trees. 
There were no lights in the sky, no planes or helicopters around, and no explanation as to why only I saw this. I've never been diagnosed with mental illness. I don't have a substance abuse problem, and I certainly wouldn't have had myself and the mother and the future of my children together on a bloody motorcycle if I was high or drunk. I've never had a seizure or been told that I ever had a seizure. I've never had hallucinations and I've never experienced anything like this before, anything like it again since. I've driven past blood numerous times since then too, and every time it's just been its normal old sleepy self. Hoping this goes here. I used to work as a transporter. When I say transporter, I mean a transporter of the recently deceased. How this job would work is we would receive a text of a location and the name of the deceased. We would then go and pick up the freshly passed from their house, or the accident site, or the old folks home, etc. When we arrived at the location of the deceased, we would have to pack them up. That means handling them. Keep in mind that the bodies make noises and grunts and groans. They're still warm and stiff. We would then have to bag them and move them onto a stretcher, then strap them down. Once they'd been placed in the van, your partner would leave and you would drive the deceased to the funeral home. Here's the catch. Even if my partner was not in the van with me, I never felt alone. Once my door was shut, I would start getting a sharp itch and pressure just behind my ear. Never failed. Body after body, this feeling was always there. When asked how it feels to see the deceased, I would always reply with the same answer. It's never bothered me. To me, the souls left, and it was just an empty vessel. I guess though the soul may have left the vessel, but they seem to still be hanging around for a while. Upon arrival at the funeral home, the deceased would often offload and be brought into their prep room. If one spirit was noticeable, walking to the prep room was very noticeable. I remember one funeral home had a camera system that I hoped just had a malfunction. One of the cameras would static and flash, then turn black, only to cut out just when you looked at it. This other one you would have to walk through the whole building just to turn the lights on, the prep room being behind you all the way. This building always had a habit of having the doors behind you open after you went through them. Doing this job was, well, interesting. I'm not sure how to really express how overbearing the atmosphere was in one of the funeral homes. We're at about 0200. But if you want a creepy time, go hang out in the prep room during the witching hour. I no longer work being a transporter. I swapped out to work as an on-call pallbearer. Seems I cannot escape the dead. The first story was about me working as a transporter a few years ago then moving on to call Paul Bearer. Someone had asked if I had ever had any other experiences, so I thought I might post a few and see how they're received. If you would all like to know more, let me know. So I've always had bizarre experiences and dreams since I was a kid, and even now, though fortunately they've calmed down, Due to how long it's been for some of these, time will have marred my memory. I'll try to keep this as accurate as possible, and sort my stories by houses. A side note, my parents separated when I was around two or something, so the stories for when I was visiting my mom will be separated per house as well. I've lived in lots of different places in my city, and until recently I've had something happen in each of my houses and apartments from apparitions to just terrible sleep paralysis. So let's start with my first house. I grew up in a small home with my dad and brother. Things were not easy, 
and day to day always presented a new challenge from not being able to afford food to a rather, let's say, troubled childhood. Anyway, I only remember a few experiences from that first house. One of the biggest ones that stuck with me was during an early morning breakfast. My brother and I were sitting at the table. The table was situated close to the door that ran to the basement. I remember hearing our cat running up the stairs, and when I looked over, I saw our fuzzy friend beelining around the corner like a bat out of hell. It was odd for that cat to act like that. He was old and was not that active anymore. Looking up from where the cat turned the corner, I saw a humanoid figure with horns and a hound by his side. I chalked it up to my child brain to put whatever it was into that form. But this entity was just there now watching my brother and I eating breakfast. We just stared at each other for what seemed like forever until I was finally able to look away scared and get my brother's attention. When we looked back, it was gone. I never felt safe in the basement. There was always something off about it. But what kid likes the basement? Pretty sure that's just normal. Following that event, I remember two more odd things that happened in that house. They're the same event that happened at different times. I remember waking up at night. As a kid, I was unsure what the exact time was. Laying in bed, I opened my eyes to white mist or fog. It wasn't wet. It was just there. You could see through it fine as well as you could see everything in the house almost as if you had your lights on. I opened my door and left my room to look down the hall, and it was the same. A white mist that allowed you to see it as if it was day. I would write it off as nothing, but it would happen again to me in the same house. The mist had the same characteristics, visible that it was there but never blocked your vision. It only allowed you to see as if the sun was out. Eventually, we moved out of that house and into a different neighborhood with my dad's girlfriend. Unfortunately, things only picked up for me. Terrifying Childhood Experience When I was about eight, I was sleeping in my room. It was about 3 a.m. when I slowly woke up to a voice saying calmly, but with a sense of urgency, Wake up. Get out of here. Get out. You're not safe. Get out. I couldn't even point if it was a male or a female whisper. It was so neutral. I got up from my bed, nothing in my room. Got out of the bedroom, turned the hallway light on, and again, nothing. Then this huge sense of urgency fell upon me out of nowhere. I ran to my parents' room. I entered as quietly as I could so I wouldn't wake them up. They didn't. So I closed the door behind me and went around their bed, in a way that their bed was positioned between me and the door. Then the same voice that woke me up kept saying, You're still not safe. Stay here. Don't move. Stay here. It's not safe. I stood there, crouching behind my parents' bed for a few minutes. Then I looked over the bed toward the door. In the faint light coming through the small gap beneath the door, of the light I left on in the hallway, I see a pair of shadows moving, like feet. As if someone was moving back and forth in front of the bedroom door. The shadow kept moving for a few seconds, then suddenly stopped as if the person behind the door stopped moving and was staring at the door, a few centimeters away from it. It just stood there, motionless in front of the door for a few minutes, then just walked away. I saw the shadow moving, disappeared. The voice then kept saying, Okay, it's better now, but you're still not safe. Stay here. It's still not safe. After about 15 minutes with no shadow, no voice, no movement, no nothing, the voice came back and calmly said, 
It's safe now. You can go back to bed. And so I did. Just got up, walked to my room, feeling perfectly safe and calm, and fell asleep, as if nothing happened. It said my name. I had just come back from working the night shift at a long-term care facility for the elderly. I lived alone in my apartment on the second floor. My door was bolt-locked. It was 6.30 a.m. and I finally laid down to sleep. I had my bedroom window open and I could hear the cars driving on the highway. All of a sudden I hear my name being whispered. I kind of figured it was a mixture of exhaustion and me warping the car sounds. I continued trying to sleep when I heard my name in a very clear, loud whisper and I froze. Then I heard the breathing. You know how when shivers run down your spine? I got shivers that shot through me from my feet to my skull and a feeling of pure dread. I was instantly sweating. I turned over in my bed and slowly covered the blankets over my head. The footsteps proceeded around my bed toward me. I could hear the breathing getting closer. I was so scared I think I just shut down and eventually fell asleep. The next day I went about my day. When I finally came home, I pulled into the parking lot of the building, parked, looked up at my apartment. I got that dread feeling in my stomach. I had completely forgotten what happened that whole day until when I got home. I thought it must have been so traumatizing that my brain shut it out. But here I was, remembering, went over to my neighbors to tell her what had happened. I went home later after I felt brave enough and tried talking to it. I said, I don't want any problems. I just want peace. I realized whatever this thing was, it had to have been around for a while to learn my name. I never saw or heard anything in that apartment again, though. It sounds insane, I know. This isn't the first time I've witnessed breathing in footsteps. The other time I actually saw a figure and it scares the shit out of me thinking about what I've experienced. I just haven't written them all out on here yet. I think there might be some sort of time distortion going on in my house. To recap quickly, I saw something looking like my boyfriend two times, neither of which really were him. One time he came home, physically opening the doors, but didn't react to me saying hi, so I follow him into a room. When I entered, no one was there. Turns out he was still at school at that time. Second time I saw my boyfriend get up and go out of bed and into the bathroom but my real boyfriend was still in bed next to me. My grandma also claimed to see me open and close the living room door repeatedly, but at the time I was somewhere else with my boyfriend. Today I saw myself going through the kitchen, turning around and looking at something, and then going into the living room. Obviously I was kind of freaked out by this, but I went after it, because I really wanted to figure out what was going on. I was trying to trust my gut feeling on these things. I didn't feel threatened or in danger, so I followed the thing, but I kind of bumped into the kitchen table with my hip and something small fell off. It obviously made a small sound, and since I was already on edge, I turned around. But I saw that it was only one of my grandma's spools of thread that had rolled off the table. So I turned back around and went to the living room, and no one was there again. Now, I guess if I was smart, I would have figured out then and there, but I kind of didn't piece it together until I told my boyfriend what I kind of just told you. Well, he said, sounds like I basically retraced the exact steps of this doppelganger. I went toward the living room, then turned around because of the noise, before turning back around and going into the living room. 
Now that I look at it from this angle, all actions these things have been doing are normal things, like coming home, going to the bathroom, opening doors and stuff. I even kind of remember that I was banging doors when I was younger to annoy my grandma, which describes what she claimed to see perfectly. Do you guys think it might be possible that there's some sort of time distortion going on, for lack of a better term? Like, either we see some sort of recording from what happened already, or something that's yet to happen, like my encounter today. The weirdest thing while doing it, I didn't even realize I was basically doing the exact same thing my doppelganger was doing, until it was brought up to me. Something in my home started to imitate my family. I'm 22 years old and female. I have a history with mental illness, CPTSD and depression, but no illness that is commonly associated with hallucinations or the like. I live together with my boyfriend and my grandparents, my childhood home, and ever since I was little some weird things would happen. Most commonly, we would see someone or something inside the house, even though all of us were in the garden. But I rarely have ever encountered anything face to face. When I was 16, my mother passed away, and I inherited a jewelry box. I believe something pretty bad was attached to it, and I had a very horrible experience back then. I put the jewelry box away since and haven't seen that thing again ever since. To retell that story here would be way too long, so I just quickly mentioned it. I only mention all of this so everybody has a good idea of my personal background. Maybe that helps in figuring out what's going on now, though. The situation at hand is that something seems to be impersonating family members. It started a few weeks ago when I was home earlier than everybody else and I was waiting for my boyfriend to come home too. I was on my PC when I heard the door handle being pushed down. It's a bit squeaky. The door was opened and I heard heavy footsteps behind me going into the bedroom. It sounded perfectly identical to my boyfriend's footsteps. I called out to say hi and at first didn't think anything of it because he often rushes past me into the bedroom because he needs a little bit for himself when coming home. I didn't get any reply, and that was kind of weird to me. So I went into the bedroom. There was no one there. I suddenly got this really bad gut feeling and quickly left the bedroom and locked the door. I also closed the other door that had been opened. Later on, I told my boyfriend about it. He thought it was creepy too. The next day, my grandma called me upstairs because she was angry that I was up late last night and slamming doors upstairs. I asked her when I supposedly did that, and during the time frame that she said that she saw me slamming doors, I was with my boyfriend. But grandma was adamant that she saw me clear as day. Now yesterday night, I woke up in the middle of the night and saw my boyfriend get up and walk to the bathroom, open the door, and go inside but he didn't turn on the lights. That's weird because he doesn't really like the dark. Then I heard him shuffling in bed right next to me. I panicked and turned on the lights, which woke him and he was pissed. He asked why the bathroom door was open and why it woke him up. I told him what happened. He went into the bathroom to check out if there was an intruder, but there was no one there. I'm really scared and don't know what to do. We still live under my grandparents' roof and they won't allow for us to call a priest or anything of the sorts. I'm by no means a paranormal expert, but I get really, really bad feelings from those imposter things. And I like to be, well, and I like to be, you know, and I like to be live, oh, I believe they mean, and I'd like to believe that my gut feeling is usually very accurate. Does anybody have any ideas what to do, or what this is? I saw my dad. 
So my dad died earlier this year, unfortunately. The way he died was terrible, in which my whole family has to go to therapy. And yet I still miss him and love him always. To get into the experience, I've moved around a lot this year due to personal problems since my dad's passing. I also got two puppies this year from the same litter. Lost my dad and dog on the same day. Kind of like a replacement for the two loved ones I've lost this year. One of the dogs was quiet and usually chill. Except he's had moments where he starts staring at a wall or something in the room randomly when he wouldn't normally do this. I know dogs have a sixth sense about paranormal stuff as well, as other cats and other animals. This behavior would happen about each month around two to three times since I got him in May. Then I moved again to my grandfather's house, in which he is my dad's older brother. There still is some tense feelings here and there because it's still a very sensitive topic for my grandparents and dad's side of the family to talk about my dad or even see videos of him. They were all close. Around the same time I started my new job, where it would require me waking up at 2, 3, or 4 in the morning to leave for work. In front of my room, there's like a tiny light that usually is on, sometimes when people forget to turn it off, though. There's nothing in the way of that light that could ever cause a shadow. One day I was leaving for work about a week ago. I go get my shoes, and I'm about to leave the front door when I look up in front of the light as a big shadow of a person. I immediately recognized who it was. It was my dad. The only reason I know it's him is because of his shoulders and height. I look and I saw his big shoulders and head. I blinked, then it went away. I closed the door to the house and went in my car. Till about ten minutes later it hit me again that I just saw my dad. I think I cried about it after work, but I couldn't tell anybody in fear of them thinking I was crazy. Ghost That Haunted My Dreams As A Toddler When I was little, I used to really have bad nightmares. They were so bad that I'd wake up in the middle of the night screaming like I was being murdered. At one point, it got so bad that my parents actually called 911 because they weren't even sure if I was breathing or not. What were these nightmares about? Being so young, it's pretty hard to remember, but I can recall two of these nightmares. In the first one, I was at my grandparents' house, playing with a toy on the floor, when my grandma was doing something in the kitchen. Then their dog barked from the other side of the house. I heard my grandma yell, Hey! At the dog. As soon as that happened, everything went quiet. I looked up from the toy to see a tall, shadowy figure where my grandma was moments before. It just stood there, staring at me. It didn't have any distinguishable features. It was like I was staring at the shadow of a tall, skinny person. The second one's a lot shorter, but it's kind of the only one I remember the most. I was in my crib at night when I heard something from the doorway. I looked over to see the exact same shadowy figure staring directly at me from the doorway. I don't remember any of the other night terrors I had when I was a kid, but I'm sure they all involved this thing. It got to the point where I was terrified of shadows and loud noises. I understand why I was afraid of shadows. But for the life of me, I can't explain where the fear of loud noises came from. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that my grandma shouted at her dog right before the shadow person showed up. Maybe it had nothing to do with those nightmares at all. I really don't know. Normally, I wouldn't be concerned by this. For all I know, I saw something like this on TV when I was little and had nightmares about it. I wouldn't even consider it a paranormal experience. If my mom hadn't seen the same thing I had. She came home late one night to find the entire apartment dark. Assuming my dad had just left for work, she walked toward her bedroom, which was at the end of the hallway and across from mine. That's when she saw the tall, shadowy figure at the top end of the hall, in front of my bedroom. At first she assumed it was my dad, 
So she got mad at it and just started scaring the heck out of her. Excuse me. So she got mad at it for scaring the heck out of her. But the figure didn't move. She reached behind her to turn on the light and the figure vanished. She told me about this years later and my dad backs up the claim since he recalls getting panicked phone calls from my mom saying there was a ghost in the apartment. And that's where it ends. A few years later we moved out of the apartment, but never experienced anything to do with that shadow ever again. Ever since then I always sleep with the hallway light on because I'll never forget the feeling of absolute terror I had when I saw that shadowy figure staring at me from the doorway. Pretty sure my dog and I both saw a ghost. In 1999, I moved back to Washington State, from traveling around the country for four years. My grandmother let me move in with her for a while so I could get back on my feet again. I hated the basement of her house, always have. But it was free rent and she was cool with Chuck, my 90-year-old pound black lab. Plus, my grandma and I always got along pretty well. Late one night, about three months in, I woke up because Chuck was moving around on the bed. He kept shaking the mattress. Then I heard him start grumping. You know, those grumpy groans old dogs make when you scratch behind their ears, and they love it. He started doing that. Once I realized what I was hearing, I sat up to yell at him to go back to sleep. That's when I discovered the reason he was moving around so much. He was trying to get closer to the woman standing right next to my bed, scratching him behind the ear. I didn't scream, and I'm proud of that. But also, what the actual f... Where'd she come from? Who was she? Why the hell was she standing in my room, petting my dog at 3 a.m.? I was too scared to ask. I did the only thing I knew how to do in these situations. Hid under the blanket. Certainly, she would be gone by the time I re-emerged from under the blanket. That's how these things are supposed to work, right? I waited for a little while, but when I came out from under the blanket, she was still there. So I hid under the blanket again. Three more times. Every time I came back out, she'd still be there, smiling at me and scratching my dog's ears. The last time I was under the covers, I realized I wasn't actually afraid of the woman. Chuck and I met under stressful situations for both of us. Because of that, he and I had a super strong bond. I trusted him implicitly. If she'd meant me harm, he would have reacted to her negatively. His reaction was clearly positive, so I figured that she probably wasn't there to kill me. So, I came out from under the blanket on the last time, intending to deal with the freaky woman still standing next to my bed. Somehow I decided that turning on the light would make her disappear. I reached over and snapped the bedside lamp on. I don't know why I thought that would work. Is that even a thing? Are ghosts supposed to disappear in the light? Well, I turned on the light and she didn't, so I don't think that's a thing. But then she'd been standing at my bedside, petting Chuck for several minutes, and I was out of ghost-busting options. So I gave up on being terrified and just looked at her. Really looked at her. I can still see her right now in my mind dressed up in a classy brown pantsuit with a cream-colored blouse. She had shoulder-length auburn hair styled beautifully with these long, big, curly loops. She looked like she'd been on her way to work party or something. She only stopped by for a second to say hello. She was very pretty. She looked happy. I didn't have the nerve to talk to her, but at least I don't remember speaking, but I stayed present and we looked at each other for a while. I remember having the distinct impression of her knowing I was there, both of us being aware of the other. Then she stopped petting Chuck and walked to the end of my bed, stood up straight and proud, and dissolved away. I mean that very literally. First her clothes, then her skin, organs, and bones. Like that Nazi at the end of Indiana Jones' Raiders of the Lost Ark. I remember what her blood looked like as it dissolved away to reveal her skeleton. Yes, Gecko. That should be gross and terrifying in memory, but I don't remember it like that. 
At the time, it felt like she was doing it on purpose, like she'd wanted to leave in the most dramatic exit that she could manage. I remember thinking, this should scare the pants off me, but also, wow. Somehow I got back to sleep. In the morning, over coffee, I was going to tell my grandmother about what happened, but she'd just received an upsetting phone call. Apparently, her best friend from high school, Ursula, had passed away in the middle of the night. I'd heard stories about their teenage shenanigans, especially the one about the stolen birthday cake. But I never saw a picture of Ursula, so I asked what she looked like. I couldn't tell you what she looked like these days, but when we were young, she had the most beautiful curly auburn hair. That's not the only weird thing that happened in my grandmother's basement but it remains the most vivid and least scary. Have a good night, guys. See ya.